Hello, welcome again to your 100 most popular cars ever, as voted for by you, the Men and Motors viewers. And things are getting pretty tense now because we've reached the top 40 countdown. So in at number 40, it's the Aston Martin DB5. Probably the best known Aston Martin of all time, the Aston Martin DB5 shot to superstardom in the 1964 James Bond movie, Goldfinger. I wish I was 30 years older, so that was around when that car ca first came out. I mean, it just looked beautiful. Plus, it had a Browning machine gun, bulletproof glass front and rear, tyre slashes. I mean, it was just like the kid's car of love. It was just gorgeous. I love it. It's faultless. Although production DB5s weren't offered with Browning machine guns, passenger ejector seats or revolving number plates, the car's film star looks won fans immediately. Oh, it's Sophia Loren, it's Grace Kelly, it's just absolutely perfect. It's tasteful, it's elegant, it's powerful, it's sexy, it's, for me, probably the best looking car ever. Aston Martin made the DB5 for just over a year between 1964 and 1965. With only 1,021 cars built, the model has become one of the most sought after Aston Martins. Now at number 39, a car that used to be driven by Princess Anne. Better known for producing three-wheelers, Reliant unveiled the sports coupe, the Scimitar. As far as I'm concerned, the only thing that I know about the Reliant Scimitar is that Princess Anne had one, and that's what made it very popular. Quite why, I don't, do not know, because just because Princess Anne wore a funny hat doesn't mean that I'm going to go out and wear one. Released in 1968 as a stable mate to the successful Scimitar GT Coupe, it followed the Reliant tradition, the construction consisting of a stiff separate chassis under a rust-free fiberglass body. I mean, the whole thing. I mean, anyone that starts off by building a plastic car it needs to have their head looked at. I mean, the, the whole thing was just useless. And having um, things like the rear wipers powered through a puny 5 amp cable is just madness. It, the car should never have gone into production. I've, I've never had reliability problems with my cars. Uh, they've been regularly serviced and as a result they've, they've done huge mileages without having any, um, any problems with them. Um, it is important to keep certain aspects of the cars um, up to scratch. The maintenance of, of uh, the cooling system is one of the things that um, if neglected will give, will give problems. They will overheat. Whether you love or hate the looks, under the bonnet was a different story. Powered by a Ford straight six, three litre engine, the Scimitar could do speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour. As well as, as regular everyday use, this particular car uh, has done classic rallying. Um, it did a five day, very, very hard um, rally in Ireland earlier this year. It was about 2,000 miles and um, that particular rally destroyed several other um, more notable cars than this, and this came through it virtually unscathed. With its wood veneer dash, wire wheels and seat belts, it had it all. But it was beset with problems. It wasn't uncommon for a scimitar to have ended life in a spectacular blaze. Reliant stopped producing them in 1986, but they remain a highly individual, practical and inexpensive touring estate and well deserve a place in the top 100. Now, next stop, number 38. The old disco has been around since 1989 and has remained very popular, even though there are far more sophisticated and better built machines on the market. For a car that's seen in cities as much as on farmers' fields, it's got a terrible turning circle, drinks fuel, and it's got pretty vague steering. But over the years, Land Rover has gradually improved things, especially now that parent company Ford is writing the checks. The one great thing about Land Rover is that they, they don't forget their roots. So when they come up with a new vehicle, uh, no matter how sophisticated and how appealing it is in terms of status and everything else, they don't forget that it actually does have to perform um, in the rough. And although they know from their market research that um, a lot of people who drive the vehicles never even get the tyres muddy, they know that, that those people need to know that if they do take it out into the moorland and the bogs and everything else, they're going to get through it. Unlike some of the designer soft roaders out there that will cry if they get their tyres muddy, 
The Discovery doesn't mind doing what it does best, discovering over rocks, up lanes, fording streams. Try to break it and it just comes back for more. It came at a time where everything was getting sleeker and smoother and more stylized in a very slippery, smooth, sort of continuous lines kind of idea. And suddenly this square, boxy, very utilitarian looking car came out. And everybody thought, what a relief this is. We do not have to look like the person next to us and the person behind us and the person in front of us anymore. Here is something that I can be a little bit individual with. The brand new Mark III Land Rover Discovery dismisses almost all the criticism of the previous models. The original Discovery was built on the chassis of the Mark I Range Rover, so was heavily compromised in many areas. Well, the Mark III Discovery is really following the trend set by the Range Rover. When you think the Range Rover introduced in the, the very late 60s, uh, early 70s, it was a very basic vehicle. Um, mine, uh, in those days, had vinyl seats and rubber mats. And then the Range Rover became more sophisticated. The, the leather came in, you know, the polished wood, the stereo systems, you know, and the price went up and up and up, and it became a, a luxury vehicle. And uh, I think it's a bit sad, really, that Discovery is going down the same path. This old time has been refreshed for the 21st century, and it's better than ever. Now, they always say you should never judge a book by its cover, but you know, with the Audi TT, it's hard not to. We were stunned when we saw the first design exercise for the TT. Um, I mean, it really was completely different to anything we'd seen before at, um, at Audi. It had these huge wheels that completely filled the wheel arches, and it was, it was like one of these uh, design exercises you see at the Royal College of Art um, student show and the Coventry uh, design course, you know, um, the students make up a clay model of what they think a car is going to look like in, you know, 10 years time. This is my ultimate car, 100%. There's nothing else on the market now, uh, even two years on from when I first bought it, that actually I would swap this for at all. Like any true coupe, the TT has always been able to hide its more humble underpinnings. Under those sexy curves lies the floor plan of the last generation Golf. You look back through Audi's history, and um, yeah, it's a really illustrious one as well, but, but they were doing great cars, I mean really stunningly good cars, even before the Audi Quattro. Um, they were doing the Audi 200 Turbo, it was a stonking car, I mean really just went like the wind and okay it didn't have the image that um, the TT has now but uh, certainly they were putting down the foundations of very very quick and, and very stable and very exciting cars long before the TT. So if you are the one who likes to judge the book by its cover, in the case of the Audi TT you won't be disappointed. At number 36, we have the Mitsubishi GTO. I thought we'd covered everything that had ever come out of Japan, but apparently not. The Mitsubishi 3000 GT first began production in 1990. Known as GTO in its homeland, Japan, the 3000 GT represented the cutting edge of Mitsubishi's technology. The Mitsubishi GTO was really in a class of its own for the time. This was a super sports car. It had record-breaking performance, four-wheel drive, four-wheel steer, four-wheel anti-lock brakes. There was nothing else around at the time, and people loved this car. Driving enthusiasts loved this car and were scared by it because it really was a proper driver's car. The looks of the 3000 GT are one of those contentious issues that people have really loud discussions about. Intended to challenge Ferrari for the title of sexiest sports car maker, I think you'd have difficulty convincing many people they've achieved their aim. The design of it, like I said, it looks like a Ferrari and for a lot less money, so... Yeah, it was definitely the Ferrari looks and performance as well. In at number 35 is a car that has no direct rivals and is unique in the world. And the reason, its engine and its name, the Mazda RX-8. Unique's a very strong word. You can't have degrees of uniqueness. It has to be different singularly. Okay, so what makes the RX-8 unique is the lack of pillars the suicide doors, the very comfortable rear seats, and the rotary engine. 
Take any one of those elements and it would be very different. Put them all together and you've got a unique car. So at the heart of the RX-8 is a unique rotary engine developed from the ideas of a Dr. Felix Vankel. The rotary engine is a combustion engine similar to your normal piston engine but it works in a very different way. I mean it works on the same basic four straight principle so it takes in a mixture of air and fuel compresses it, it combusts and then it ex expels the gases. So same sort of principle but where it differs is that a rotary engine has an almost oval shaped chamber in which triangular shaped rotor spins and as that rotor spins it creates pockets of air and gas that are slowly compressed as it completes its cycle. At the point where it's at its smallest compression point it encounters a piston which goes bang, forces it round and the whole engine cycle starts again. Climbing aboard for the first time really is quite an event. With the absence of centre pillars and rear mini doors that have no exterior handle, this car is full of surprises. Personally, I'm not a big fan of the interior of the RX-8. It's quite sumptuous and certainly the ones that I've sat in have been a lot of black and red leather. But they are unique, you know, they offer each person that's going to sit in that car a bucket seat. You can get four adults in there reasonably comfortably. And also you've got those great pillarless doors that make kind of entry and exit a lot easier. So in terms of the actual market it's competing and it's probably very attractive to its purchasers, certainly. The future sure looks bright for this four-seater sports coupe. And with growing numbers on the roads, this innovative masterpiece deserves its place in our chart. Next up in 34th place is a Lotus. Now, Lotus needed a new car desperately in the late 90s. The glory days of Colin Chapman and the Mark I Elan were a distant memory, and the Esprit was being left behind by hot hatches. It's one of the best cars, I would say, for someone who is interested in track days, because you, can, you really could drive it you know, for the week, and then at the weekend uh, take it off and have a, a track day, um, or even compete at, at you know, fairly low level unless you want to spend an awful lot of money on the car but you can certainly compete at a club level and you can track day it or even hill climb it or whatever you want to do and stand some chance of success. When you first see the the, aerodin the extra aerodynamics that it has that the Elise doesn't have it's kind of it's a real wow factor it has real road presence it looks really aggressive on the road uh, and then when you actually drive the car at speed on a racetrack you, you realize that all the sticky outy bits really do things the, the front splitter on the front is actually sucking the car to the road the, the large aerofoil on the back is actually pushing the back of the car down, getting the maximum grip out of the tyres. So they're the things that you even, once you drive the car, you love even more. Well, the Exige was more than just an Elise with a roof. Lower, wider and more powerful, the Exige provided a real performance boost over the Elise. It wasn't any more comfortable, though. Getting in was akin to climbing into a post box, and you best like noise once you're inside. It's noisy, it blats along, it's got, it holds the road like a leech. Um, you've got to be very, very stupid indeed or be going very fast indeed to lose it. So, yeah, it gives you a great thrill. So with some clever branding and by going back to their brief of making lightweight, back to basic sports cars, plus, of course, a bit of foreign investment, Lotus have pulled themselves back from the brink. And that's good news for all of us. So what have you voted for today? At 40, the British gents' favourite, the Aston Martin DB5. At 39, the Reliant Scimitar. In at 38, the ground-eating Land Rover Discovery. At 37, the sleek and stylish Audi TT. The Mitsubishi GTO stands at 36. The cleverly engineered Mazda RX-8 is at 35. And in 34th place, it's the Lotus Exige. Well, that's it for part one, but here we go again with some more clues to a car that you didn't vote for. Now, this one is very, very German, and it's probably carried more US presidents, British prime ministers, and general VIPs than any other car in history. What is it? Tell you in a sec. Welcome back to your 100 most popular cars. And if you were wondering what the car is that's been carrying all those dignitaries and VIPs, it was, of course, the Mercedes S-Class. Thank you to Mr. Blair from Downing Street for ringing in with the correct answer. So let's go back to the chart proper. And here is the supercar to end all supercars. The Park Lane showroom isn't there anymore, but hands up London car fans who made a detour by Hyde Park just to peek into the window and admire those gorgeous curves. The McLaren F1 was made to astonish both the bystander and the driver. The McLaren F1 was um, amazingly expensive, uh, basically because McLaren thought they could get away with it. Um, 
if you are going to produce a handful of um, absolutely unique motor cars and you know that there are 50 people in the world who can afford to buy it, um, then it doesn't really matter what you're going to charge for it. Um, so you might as well charge a huge amount of money and, uh, and try and get something back. The McLaren F1 was designed to take everything to the limit. The fastest, the most powerful, the most expensive, yet still keep things road legal, even in America. The McLaren F1 holds several records, including the highest top speed, 240.1 miles an hour, and the fastest lap speed on the UK circuit, 195.3 miles an hour. But why did they want to create a production car? Why let daylight in on the magic of Formula One to the enthusiastic punter with enough cash? I think the F1 gave um, the few people who bought it um, the, the ultimate status symbol. Um, and I don't think anyone who bought an F1, or for that matter, a, a 220 Jag or whatever, you know, a, a Bugatti, um, EB110 ever use more than a fifth at the, at the most of the available power and the available road holding on a public road. The McLaren may not be a car that any of us can ever aspire to own. Indeed, they only made about a hundred, but it's certainly one that most of us have a poster of in our garage or our bedroom. Gordon Murray, who is a design genius, produced, in my opinion, the greatest car of all time because it's not just a supercar with high performance that's useless for anything else. It's extremely comfortable. It will carry a great deal of luggage as well as three passengers. It's got a sensational performance which has never been bettered and it's made to McLaren standards. And if you put all that lot together, there is nothing else ever that can beat it. Thank you to McLaren for making this fantastic dream come true. Next up, in 32nd place, the Countach was Lamborghini's replacement for their legendary Mura. It made its debut at the 1971 Geneva Motor Show. I think you have to be Italian to be able to pronounce Lamborghini car names properly. I mean, I'm from the north of England and they just sound stupid pronounced by me. I mean, Lamborghini silhouette I can just about get away with, but your Diablo and your, you know, Countach, your Countach Quattro Valvolio, it just sounds ridiculous. Lamborghini once again turned to the now infamous Marcello Gandini from Bertone to design their new car. 30 years on, the wedge shape may have dated, but it's lost none of its impact. Back in the early 80s, if you would have looked at my bedroom wall, between my pictures of Daisy Duke and, say, Emma Sams, would have been probably an Anthena poster of a Lamborghini Countach. In hindsight, I'm not too sure that was a very good idea because uh, as I grew older, I got to, to drive a Contash and I didn't like it at all. But back then, I mean, it was a car that was just evocative. In the 80s, you, you think about what we was watching on TV, we was watching Dallas and Dynasty with big padded shoulders on their jackets, big hair. So we had to have big cars with big bits of plastic bodywork bolted to them. And that was just right for the time. I mean, the, the doors and the design and it was a wow, I suppose. It was a proper old-school supercar. It wasn't a car for wimps with poor rear visibility, no anti-lock brakes or power steering, and a driving position that didn't suit everybody. Your average modern Ferrari driver would shudder with fear. Most outrageous, most fastest car I could afford, really. And I thought about Ferrari, and then I thought, well... But, that, I mean... There's nothing really as outrageous as a Lamborghini, is it? I mean, it's an incredible car, incredible. And touch wood, it's been very reliable. The classic Italian driving position, now there's a thing. It's also been adopted by the young lads today who've got their Peugeot 106s. And it consists really of, you know, how straight you can get your arms and how far you can lay back. I mean, it's all, it's all fairly, you know, it's all like that, isn't it? It's laid back, it's straight arms. Ferrari 308, what a great car that is, beautiful thing, but try and drive one. The steering wheel's on your knees, the seat's sculptured like a bucket that's the wrong angle. You, it, it, it's just rubbish. I mean, the steering wheel juts up like a, a milk float steering wheel. So the, um, whether Italians have all got bare backs, you know, that gener generation of Italians are all walking around these days going, so it's wrong with back, and I, I can't work out why. It was because you drove in a crap driving position, mate, all those years ago. There was only one way to drive a car, and that's sitting upright with your arms, you know, slightly bent at the steering wheel. Why they got it so wrong, I never know. 
So the Countach may not be everybody's cup of tea, but then that's not really what supercar superstardom is all about, is it? And do you realize that between 1974 and 1990, only 1,500 of these were ever made? A supercar that really did represent an era. The car at number 31 was hailed as an instant classic on its release in 1995. The stunning BMW Z3 has the highest accolade of all. It was Piers Brosnan's co-star in GoldenEye. I remember being really excited again when I saw the Z3 for the first time, couldn't wait to get in it, and I do remember being overwhelmingly disappointed, really underwhelmed by the car. I, I didn't find it... Um, what I, well, I, did, I wanted it to be something really special to drive, and it just wasn't, and, and the looks didn't quite work for me either. Commanding superstar fees of £13,000 for the base model, this car is George Clooney, a powerful yet rugged 2.8-litre engine hidden under a suave exterior with the ability to sweep ladies off their feet from 0 to 60 in less than seven seconds. The performance is uh, just outstanding. You know, you drive this car with a smile on your face. I can't say the handling is brilliant, you know, when you compare this with a top-notch uh, sports car, you know, it won't compare simply because you've got a soft top car, it's not as stiff as a normal car. But for a roadster, it is just outstanding. The Z3 may not win the Oscar for best performance, losing votes for its road manners. Its original lacklustre four-cylinder engine produced a lonely 118 brake horsepower. But as with most of the greats, it has matured with age. The thing about the Z3, um, it didn't handle, to be fair. It didn't handle. Uh, half the problem was, was the steering wheel. The standard wheel on it um, was huge. And just trying to kind of put in any kind of... Um, any kind of directional um, intervention was tough enough. Um, but it had a long bonnet, a low driving position, you felt you were over the rear axle. If you did have any power, then it would kick out quite easily when you turn the traction control off. The Z3, destined for sure for a place on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, but it has just missed out on a place in the top 30. The IS200 often comes very high in customer satisfaction surveys, and it's no wonder why. With true Japanese build quality and a package that includes so many potential optional extras as standard, it gives German sporty saloons a real run for their money. Like a lot of cars in this list, they, it drives a lot better than its image. The IS200 is uh, a reasonable car um, and handles like an equivalent, you know, mid-sized BMW or Mercedes, probably as good. But the problem is its image. The first thing that attracted me to the IS200 was the value for money, and on top of that, just the pure looks. I think it's a great looking car, and like I said, value for money against other uh, cars in the series. It's, you know, it's got every extra you could need. The Lexus IS200 has been ruined by Alan Partridge, of which I take no credit for but it's a, surely a good thing. The Lexus, when they started out, were subtle uh, cars uh, that really did give you know, Mercedes a run for the money. The first big Lexi, as I believe they're called now, uh, were you know, very subtle luxury cars. The TV character Alan Partridge may drive a Lexus IS200, but don't be put off by that. It certainly hasn't put off the thousands of you who've put it into our top 100. At the Geneva Motor Show in 1999, Ferrari unveiled the car that was going to succeed the much-loved 355. And this turned out to be one of the most significant developments in the entire history of the company. Designed by the legendary Pininfarina, inspiration for the 360 came from classic Ferraris like the 269 and the Dino. Somehow, this beautiful, curvaceous body manages to disguise the car's huge dimensions. But the car isn't just about style, because along with the use of aluminium throughout, it features radical new technology that would make the 360 one of the most advanced Ferraris of all time. All Ferraris were, and I suspect still are, extremely temperamental. Um, and as a practical day-to-day -day road car, I, I couldn't see myself owning one. And I think there are a huge amount of money for not a lot back. Uh, I think there's such a lot of mythology surrounding that name. Um, and I don't see why you should pay so much for that. 
Designing any sports car is a big task. After all, gone are the days when you could simply put a whacking great big engine in it and make it go fast in a straight line. Even the Americans aren't doing that anymore. The car is a supercar for the 21st century. Um, underneath the skin is a um, aluminium space frame, which is NASA technology in its own right. Behind the seats is a, a wonderful engine, powerful, but it makes its own music. You don't need to use the radio in the Ferrari. You just listen to the engine. Ferrari also reckons that the 3.5-litre V8 will propel the 360 to 60 in 4.5 seconds and to a top speed in excess of 180 miles an hour. When you're driving the 360, it's, it's like the car and the driver become one in harmony. The, uh, the technology behind the, the engine, or the engineering behind the car, is, is so unique that when you're going around the corner, you feel absolutely 100% safe. Um, acceleration is really phenomenal. You go back in the seat, uh, you pull with the power, and the, you can I really understand the Ferrari Formula One racing technology being inbuilt into the production cars. Now, nobody's saying the 360 is the best or even the most beautiful Ferrari of all time, although it is quite sexy. What this car does represent is Ferrari's ability to continually push the technological barriers. Two-seater roadsters are desirable at the best of times, and most will get into this list on that basis alone. But here at number 28, we have one that really does stand out from the crowd. Shamelessly replicating the 60s Lotus Elan, the Mazda MX-5 offered real two-seat sports car desirability to the masses. Available on its launch in 1990 for the same price as a Vauxhall Cavalier, the baby Mazda was a revelation. The Mazda MX-5 is, I think, the most popular roadster that's ever been sold. It is hugely popular. People love it. And I don't know why, it's never done it for me. I would have an MR2 any day of the week. Dynamically, the MX-5 was straight out of the top drawer. As ridiculous as it sounds, Porsche and even Ferrari would have trouble matching the Mazda for feel. Obviously, they don't compete for performance or ultimate desirability. It's a good fun handling car. It corners very, very well. Um, it's very easy to drive, even as a, from a beginner, but it can be driven very quickly on a circuit. Just as the Ford Motor Company developed the Capri after market research, Opel in Rüsselsheim in Germany seemed to draw similar conclusions as on first glance the Opel Manta and the Ford Capri have an awful lot in common. But it's the Opel that we turn to next at number 27. And I just think it looked different. It was, you know, a very radical, different looking car and it was an alternative to the Capri. Um, and I can only imagine that's what was really exciting about it. The Manta was launched at the Paris show in September 1970, initially in three variations, the base model, the Manta Deluxe, and the Manta Rally. Other variations over the years included the weirdly named Berlin Etta, the Luxus, and the GTE cars. It's aged very well because it's a classic car that can, I can still drive down a road now and it will stop people by looking at it and they sort of like, look, oh, it's different and it's not like the run-of-the-mill cars that you have now, which just look, all look the same. From the original Manta A in 1970 through until the last one rolled off the production line in 1988, we had 18 years of stylish, sporty hatchbacks with a great pedigree. Manta, we salute you. Well, before we leave you again, let's chart the chart from numbers 33 to 27. At 33, the daddy of all supercars, the McLaren F1. At 32, the Lamborghini Countach. In at 31, it's the BMW Z3. Into the top 30 now, here's the Lexus IS200. The Ferrari 360 finds itself at number 29. At number 28, it's the Mazda MX-5. And at 27, you voted for the Opel Manta. So it's time to take a break now. So while we're away, have a think on this. Another car that you didn't vote for in enough numbers to make the chart proper. This one, it's real luxury. It's very British. And most important of all, John Prescott's a big fan. And that's the giveaway, surely.
Hello, welcome back. And I'm sure you all knew that John Prescott doesn't go anywhere without his Jaguar XJ in tow. Funny game motoring, the Jaguar XJ doesn't make it, but the Toyota Supra does. Despite being launched in 1979, it wasn't until 1993 that the Supra really caught the imagination of kids and buyers alike. Awe-inspiring performance came from a three-litre engine, but the real oomph was provided by bolting two thumping great big turbos onto it. The Toyota Supra was just, a, a, again, a, a, it wanted to be a muscle car, it wanted to be so much more, but it wasn't because it didn't have the style. You know, you think of supercars and muscle cars of the generations gone by, and they've got a certain uh, presence, style. The Toyota Supra uh, handled about as well as a milk float with a six-cylinder turbocharged engine. The Supra was also a hit within the modified car scene. Its combination of high performance and relatively low cost, especially on the used market, proving irresistible. If I had to have another car, um, I don't think I'd choose anything else, to be honest. Um, it's got everything that I want. It's got all the toys, the performance, and like I say, it's just the most fun that you can have with your clothes on. So with electrifying performance and a rock-solid image amongst its fans, it's no surprise the Toyota Supra is in the list. And next, at 25, we find ourselves with the Land Rover Range Rover. Back in the early 60s, Land Rover engineers began looking at the possibility of a luxury station wagon with both on- and off-road capabilities. The Range Rover finally made its debut in 1970 and was available in just one guise, a three-door estate with four-speed manual gearbox and permanent four-wheel drive. I think it caught everybody by surprise. I mean, um, they talk about it as being the first luxury off-road vehicle. It's all relative. I mean, it had a hose-down interior and stuff like that, so it's not sat-nav and leather like we expect today. Um, but compared with what else there was around, yeah, it was a revelation. And interestingly, I mean, we, we look now at things like the Porsche Cayenne and stuff. They're still struggling. They're still wondering whether or not there's a demand out there for a luxury, super expensive, relatively quick, 4x4. Four four. And yet the Land Rover proved 34 years ago there was. In 1988, the Range Rover made the first real attempt to compete with proper luxury cars. The Vogue SE had Connolly Hyde interior, aircon, and a four-speed auto box as standard. Suddenly, as soon as it was launched, you know, the Chelsea set got hold of it, uh, the hunting shooting set got hold of it, we can, we can drive it to the restaurant as well as towing the horse box, you know. It became a huge status symbol because the car said, when you were driving it, it said, oh, actually, I own a country estate. You know, that's, that's what it said about you. In 1991, Range Rover significantly updated its range. By the mid-90s, the car faced new competition from other luxury off-roaders, and the Range Rover began to feel a bit out of date for the first time in its history. I'm becoming an old fogey. I don't like the new Range Rover. I think it's bloated. I think it's far too heavy. It's become a, a Goliath. Uh, when you look at the original 70s classic Range Rover, it, it was a beautiful design. It was simplistic design, um, uh, and, and it, you know, it just had huge appeal in the lines and the way it was put together, uh, with, with no wasted, you know, corners or everything else. I, the new ones, like a, you know, an American or Japanese tank. The Range Rover, as British as rain at Wimbledon, and from Britain to the USA now, and a car that's been around since the dawn of rock and roll. The Chevrolet Corvette, I know very little about it other than it was a very, very successful American car that went very fast in a dead straight line. However, it didn't go fast around corners because Americans can't build cars that go fast around corners. Um, I have driven one um, and I have uh, had a bit of fun in one. The original Corvette appeared back in 1953 as a unique American entry in the sports car market dominated by European makes with a toothy grille and rocket ship tail lights, and only available as a two-seater convertible in polo white with a red interior, this car was going to be popular because of its uniqueness. 
I think the appeal for American cars is really what people have been brought up with on the telly. You know, people see uh, the General Lee on the Dukes of Hazzard and they want to go and buy an American car. They see Knight Rider and a Trans Am Pontiac and they want to go and buy an American car. That is what tugs their heartstrings. They, they get emotional over cars like that. Unfortunately for me, it just, they do nothing for me. I, if I was to try and say there's one American car that I would like, it would probably be the Shelby Cobra, but that's not really American. It's a, it's a British car with an American engine in it, and that's the only one. This car's got a 5.7 litre engine, but it is a heavy car, and it is quite smog controlled, so it's only 220 horsepower. But it'll get you there quick enough. It does about 130 miles per hour top speed. It's automatic, so it's really easy to drive. Being fiberglass, and 26 years old, it's got its own rattles and bangs that you sort of live to put up with. The Chevrolet Corvette is in the top 100 due to its history and its immense popularity, not just in the USA, but over here as well. Next, at number 23, it's the BMW 3 Series. The 3 Series first came to life in 1975, replacing the aging 2002 model. This compact executive car has been with us now for more than a quarter of a century and it's still going strong. The 3 Series is, is the best selling BMW in Britain because in Britain we love badgers. The car is very well engineered, it's very good to drive, but apart from anything else, if you buy a BMW, especially a 3 Series, it's saying, yes, I'm on the up. I'm a thrusting young executive. I'm an estate agent who's done particularly well recently. I'm selling a lot of drugs. It's, um, it transcends the actual car itself. There are other really good cars in, in that class, but nothing quite says that you're on the way up like a BMW 3 Series. The 3 Series is one of the most elegant looking of the BMWs. I think it'll always be a sought after model. Of course, even if you don't give a monkeys about driver involvement, you'd buy a 3 Series for the way it looks and the image it gives you. You weren't just a rep tootling along, you were at least junior management and you were motoring. Where BMW did get it wrong was with the release of the bargain basement 3 Series, the original compact, which was disappointing in both styling and handling. The 3 Series compact is frankly rubbish. Um, it was a, a cheap, decontented BMW 3 Series with very unsophisticated rear suspension, uh, a budget dashboard, no room in the back, and it didn't have that essential sort of sporty handling or performance that you would expect with a 3 Series. Um, with the latest compact, they've addressed that issue, but it's still ugly as hell. Now, since the 3 Series has been such a huge seller, there are plenty of used examples, but beware, some have been well and truly thrashed. The great news is that if you can afford a new one and you look after it, it's going to hold its value very well indeed. In 1955, while Bill Haley was rocking round the clock, the Hillman Motor Company launched something called the Apex Project, designed to find a car that was fun, affordable, could seat two adults and two children, do 60 miles an hour and 60 miles to the gallon. This was the solution. Hillman Imp, what a great car, what a great supercar. And you're all going to fall off your chair at that one, but it is rear, rear engine, rear wheel drive, Porsche 911 has got that, designed by one of Ferrari's test engineers. Um, and when it was launched, it was uh, revolutionary. Um, aluminium engine, um, overhead cam, uh, and the, the, you know, the race with them, what an exciting car to drive. It wasn't built like the Mini was to, because of the, the fuel crisis, I and mean, it was a little bit, little bit later than that. It was basically to show that motoring can be affordable to you know to to everyone, and yet you can still have good performance and you know a good a good drive, and it did it did just that. Finally launched in 1963, it sported many new and untried ideas, like an aluminium alloy engine, overhead camshaft, and an opening rear window. The innovation of the Hillman Imp is well, any innovation you've got a lot of convincing to do because people are used to what they've you know, known before, but uh, and, and, and after the, the Mini, obviously everyone was thinking stick the engine at the, you know, at the front, but they had, it, uh, they had it in the back, which I guess makes it more, you know, more practical, more space inside. And at the end of the day, they sold nearly half a million of them. So you're not going to do that if your product's ropey. With competition from the Fiat 500, BMW 700 and the Citroen 2CV, the design team opted 
for an engine positioned at the rear and angled at 45 degrees instead of vertically. The 875cc engine produced 39 brake horsepower. The way it drives, I think, is possibly one of the most entertaining things about the car and one of the reasons I, uh, I still drive one. Um, in fact, it, it feels like driving a race car, but just a bit, very, a bit slowly. Um, and uh, it just sounds great to drive in, and it feels like driving a modern car. By the time the last car rolled off the production line in March 1976, more than 440,000 had been built. And despite it not being around as long as its main rival, the Morris Mini, this Scottish gem definitely deserves to be in the top 100. Now, before we see what's at number 21 in the chart, let's see what you voted for already today. In 26th was Toyota's Super Supra. At 25, the English gent of the off-roading set, the Range Rover. In at 24, it's the Chevrolet Corvette. At 23, it's the BMW 3 Series. And at 22, one of the few cars ever to come out of Scotland, the Hillman Imp. In the 1990s, Jaguar ran into trouble. They realized they couldn't compete with other premium car manufacturers with only two cars in their lineup. And so, in 2001, they produced this. I think the X-Type was very important to Jaguar's future. It really needed to kind of extend its customer base and offer a product that was available for the young executive market. The X-Type retained Jag's sporting heritage, though. Originally available with 2.5 or 3-litre V6 engines, the car was smooth and refined, where a BMW was taut and sporting. Permanent four-wheel drive improved road holding and gave the X-Type a unique sales pitch. The average age of Jaguar buyers was traditionally in the 50s plus because it was people who'd made their money, they were going to enjoy it with a nice, luxurious, good-to-drive car. With the X-Type, they're trying to snare younger buyers who they hope will retain their loyalty to Jaguar and move on up the range. Um, the X-Type is competing against the 3 Series, against the Mercedes C-Class, against the Rover 75, against the Saab 93, that kind of class of car. Um, and four-wheel drive was its unique selling proposition when it first arrived, and the fact that this was the first time that ordinary people could afford a Jaguar. But unfortunately, the, the looks, the, the way that it was styled was, is it, for me, its biggest drawback, because it's fussy and it looks old. It doesn't look like a thrusting young person's car. What they tried to do was take the XJ6 and XJ8 style and shrink it. Purists and sentimentalists alike despair of the inclusion of a diesel engine available in the Jaguar range. But the fact is, if Jaguar hadn't broadened its appeal and strengthened its models, Jaguar wouldn't have been around for much longer. And that's not very sentimental. Nearly time for us to go. We've still got 20 more cars to see, the big 20. But here's a reminder of what's in the chart from 40 to 21. Well, it's certainly been a long old road, but just 20 to go now, the 20 best, the 20 most popular. But what's going to be number one? You might be surprised, but then again, you might not. See you just one more time. Bye-bye.